One Sky is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola, serving Alaskans quality soft drinks since 1937. By Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, an Alaska Native Corporation promoting economic and social progress for people throughout the state. Welcome to One Sky, a special presentation of Heartbeat Alaska, a forum for Native issues and concerns. One voice, one sky. Hello and welcome to One Sky. One Sky is a program produced by One Sky Productions, the same people that bring you Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green. Today is the first program of One Sky. One Sky will focus on issues, hopefully one issue per program. This week, we take a look at waste and sanitation problems in rural Alaska. We'll have a film brought to us by the state of Alaska, as well as a panel discussion moderated by Mr. John Tetpon. Sky's ball! Sky's ball! You eat it! You eat the ball! This is Sky Michael Chayuk. He lives in a poor part of the world, sometimes called the Third World. His people have lived in this country for thousands of years. In Sky Michael's country, there is no running water and no sewer system. Here, villagers dump human waste in a lagoon near the edge of town. In Sky Michael's country, handling raw sewage is a daily fact of life. Sky Michael's country is America. There are more than 200 villages in Alaska. Like Chivak, where Sky Michael lives, most are far removed from urban areas, accessible only by airplane or boat. Native Alaskans have lived here for 10,000 years, and the legacy of its first inhabitants is still visible in many aspects of village life. Just as their ancestors did, the villagers of Chivak begin setting up their fish camps every year at this time for the annual run of herring and salmon. Here, my ways are set, you know, have been set like way back from my ancestors to here. We know what to do each day. We know what to expect. Uh, there's a lot of pride you know, in our culture. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that I wouldn't treat this world or anything else in the world. I, I enjoy living around here. It's the way I was taught to live by my fathers and their fathers. And it's a good life. But some of this traditional life has changed radically. Large communities or even small communities uh, who didn't exist 200 years ago. 200 years ago, the, uh, we had primarily bands of people that moved from one place to the other. And through the introduction of, of outside government structures and laws and regulations, people moved into communities that were organized. As more people settled into permanent villages and populations grew, sewage began to accumulate. For three decades, state and federal government has installed sanitation facilities in rural Alaska. As a result, 40% have flush toilets, but in more than half the communities, the systems are rudimentary. The climate has proved a formidable challenge to conventional systems, and modern technology is too expensive for most villages. So, like the other 500 people who live in Chivak, Sky Michael and his family use a bucket to go to the bathroom. We have a portable uh, bathroom, which we call a, we lovingly call a honey bucket around here in the villages, and that's Usually, you know, we have it right there. And that's how we, we we go in there, lift up, lift it up, and sit, sit down and take care of it right there. And we don't flush it, we don't do anything. We wait, we wait for it until it's full or it's unbearable. The smell gets unbearable. We take it down to the lagoon and dump it. So what we do is we just we use 
plastic containers, which is the norm nowadays. We line our honey bugs with the plastic bag. And when it's full, we tie up the plastic bag. And usually, it's my son that uh, takes it out and brings it down to the lagoon to dump it. When it's full, it's full. I gotta walk all the way down, spill it. Get tired. It's disgusting. It's embarrassing. When the visitors come in, you know, it's, you know, what do you do with your honey bucket? And um, there was a lot of times when uh, <laughs> there was a point when I was uh, dumping my honey bucket, you know, some people would be walking up that I don't know, or even some people here that I see, you know, it's embarrassing to be carrying your own waste. Makes, uh, God, it's awful. I. I don't like it when I come here and smell. Yeah, when I write in this bullet, I say, hurry up, come get out. Every time I I go dump a honey bucket down the lagoon, you know, I feel like I'm taking away a few years of somebody's life, you know, by dumping all that raw suits, untreated raw suits right there. It's so close to the village, you know, and it's, it's very easy for kids to just go down and um, play. And we've had cases where children fell in the dump and have caught lung infection from it. And talk about the insects, the flies. Gee, flies come great just like the millions down there in the dump. And if they've been down there, you, 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 they come flying around your house, they go in your house, get in your food. And they're just terrible. But 130 miles to the east in a village called Quithluk, it's even worse. Here, people dump raw sewage into homemade bunkers outside their houses. Just a few feet away, food dries on racks. They end up having pits, just honey bucket pits. Kids play around their house. Um, and a, a lot of them, especially when they're playing house, uh, they collect anything, uh, an old, can can and they you know they're not gonna they're not gonna think well that can is over by the the pit maybe I shouldn't get it they're not gonna think like that they're just gonna go over pick it up and use it for whatever they're playing uh, they could be playing house they could be playing cook um, and they'll use it I can't believe you know these things occur you know in, in this 20th century United States you know these things you expect to see in third world countries, poor third world countries, not in a rich country like the United States, you know. It's a shame, it's a doggone shame. That, you know, these conditions still exist in this 20th century United States. These conditions offend the dignity of the people who live here, but they also may pose a real threat to public health. A dog walking over an area that's a house pet and then comes back into the house and trots it on the floor and the baby walks on the floor and then you get the uh, hepatitis or viral meningitis or impetigo or boils, uh, dysentery. I mean, it's so easy to get and, and people don't, and the people in the villages are, are taking as much of an effort as they can to control. But if you don't have running water to wash your hands, it's, it's tough. About 40% of rural Alaskans have piped water into their residences. In 50% of the villages, household water is drawn from watering points, community wells, or washeterias and packed home in buckets. These centralized washeterias have laundry facilities and showers where people can bathe. Some choose the traditional way of bathing, steam houses. At home, shallow pans are used to wash hands. Sometimes many people use the same pan of water. The village of Imanik is a rural Alaska success story in which local, state, and federal government worked together to solve the community's sanitation problems. 
The homes have flush toilets connected to a network of above-ground pipes which use a vacuum system to suck raw sewage to a remote lagoon. The pipes are lined with Arctic insulation and warmed by waste heat from the power plant. Each home has running water pumped from the river and purified at a sophisticated water treatment center. You can build the systems, but then they are rather complex and, as I say, costly to keep up. It, the electricity costs to heat the water to keep it flowing, um, the pumping mechanisms, uh, all of that represent a huge leap forward, if you will, in the technology that the community is used to. Uh, you will need an operator, a trained and certified operator to maintain that system. You would need uh, probably a series of people just to make sure that the system is operating each day. Um, then, of course, because of the cost of, of the electricity the, and the water itself as it's being produced, you need someone to go around and collect money from the households. And that's not an easy task in rural Alaska. Um, a lot of the households are at poverty status anyway. In a lot of communities uh, which are subsistence based, it's not possible for people to pay. Uh, they just don't generate enough dollars to be able to pay for the, their utilities and the maintenance and, and, uh, and uh, paying people to run these systems. But sound economic development, such as fish processing or tourism, which would generate employment, cannot occur in these remote communities until basic sanitation services are provided. We'll be back with the panel discussion moderated by John Ted Pond right after these messages. Many times our Alaska Native culture is lost through alcohol and drug abuse. At Aquila House, we can help you regain your life as well as your heritage too. We use a holistic treatment approach for physical, mental, and spiritual values to come back to you. If you need long-term treatment for alcohol and drug addiction, the Aquila House can help you. We are a 53-bed therapeutic community and have recently added a native services. So call us, Kriana. We move on now to a panel discussion moderated by Mr. John Tedpon of Heartbeat Alaska. He talks with the Mr. Slim from rural Alaska as well as Mr. John Sandor, who is a commissioner with the state of Alaska in the Department of Environmental Conservation. John, uh, we're, we, we know that there's a, a lot of villages out there who still don't have water and sewer systems. I think there's a, more than 130 that still lack water, water and sewer. and um, can you, can you explain that a little bit and tell us what, uh, what we're dealing with here? Yes, there's about uh, 220 uh, rural Alaska Native villages um, and 135 of them uh, lack safe water and sanitation systems. This means that uh, there is unsafe water to, to drink at uh, these uh, communities and that uh, human sewage is uh, disposed of um, either by honey buckets or other unsafe system. This is unquestionably uh, Alaska's number one environmental health problem. How, how much money is it going to take? Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, a, a lot of um, people who say it's, it's going to cost a lot or, or, or more money than, than maybe it's available by one source. Um, the uh, Public Health Service and the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation Service estimate that it will take uh, 1.2 to 1.4 billion dollars and at our present rate of funding which has been um, about 25 million annually it would take 40 years to do that. Uh, we have a partnership effort or under, effort underway with the federal government uh, uh, with the, the state and with the local communities and um, we're seeking uh, 25 million dollars of federal funds uh, to match with $25 million of, of, of uh, state funds. And under that schedule, it would take uh, about 20 years to, mm -hmm. to uh, m uh, construct those safe water and sanitation facilities. Uh, Yako, you live in Kasigluk. Uh, can you describe for us uh, what it's like to, to deal with honey buckets and uh, getting water from whatever source you get? Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Right now we're using, I mean, for about uh, 50 years, as far as I know, we're still using honey buckets up to this date. <coughs> we use bunkers which were put in uh, past, uh, what, 10, 15 years. But in... Uh, well, where do you get your water from? We're getting our water from the lakes, which we haul during winter time. We haul uh, ice clear ice, which is maybe three miles away from the villages. And you have to go out there and chop it and then put it on sleds and bring it back yeah. to the village by and some machine? Melt, yeah, and then melt it in the, inside the house. And how about uh, your uh, sewage waste, your honey buckets? So wh what do you do with those? Uh? The honey buckets are, there's bunkers right uh, around the village, in the old village, uh, where we use uh, plastic uh, bags for our honey bugs, and then we dump them into the bunkers. Uh, Can you describe what a bunker is? What, what are, a what bunker are those? is made of uh, eight by four by eight, I guess, and then uh, they have a steel metal uh, top, mm -hmm. which has a cover, and we would be dumping our honey bugs right there, but during freeze up, they get full, you know, those plastics get pretty full and they freeze and there have to be a lot of waste right around that. Uh, and, and what happens during the springtime um, around the, the waste dump sites? Well, they get uh, pretty bad right around the uh, bunkers and there's so, much, so many of them around the village and they start melting in uh, you're, you're also a health aide, or you're, you're, you take, uh, you're, you're the head of the health clinic in Kasigluk. How is that a health threat, um, uh, and, and what kinds of diseases are we looking at? Well, there are so many uh, diseases, like even the flies might be uh, right around those bunkers, and then they might be spreading all that to the houses. So I think that's the way we get sick. John, um, the, the, the number one health uh, problem in, in, in rural Alaska is partly in, in part due to the fact that there's a lack of water and sewer systems. Um, uh, what, uh, what are the plans uh, of the state or, or anyone else who, who might be dealing with this? Well, let me elaborate uh, on, on Yako's um, statement about diseases. Uh, this sewage that uh, overflows the bunkers and that is dropped from the honey buckets, uh, uh, you know, in the dead of winter uh, and, and then in the spring uh, is melting. Uh, kids and dogs track that into the homes and um, children playing on the floors, of course, mm -hmm. pick that up. Um, and the diseases that are transmitted um, through this uh, unsafe water and sanitation is hepatitis A, uh, which there are a hundred cases, uh, hundreds of cases uh, now in the last year. Is that in around the Bethel region or, or uh, that's in scattered areas? really in different parts of the state? Uh, a hundred, uh, hundreds of cases, several hundred cases reported, and four fatalities, four deaths uh, within the last year, and then meningitis, uh, diarrhea. Uh, impetigo, a number of diseases, um, and just from the standpoint of the, the loss of those lives and uh, the health problems associated with those diseases, uh, uh, there's also a, a tremendous cost associated with treating mm -hmm. diseases, uh, and it's, it's estimated that it, it may cost as much as a hundred million dollars annually from the federal and state governments. Uh, just to treat the, the health problems stemming from water sanitation. And this is what has prompted um, a task force to be formed two years ago to look at this problem. And through this task force, a partnership has been formed of the federal government agencies under the leadership of the Environmental Protection Agency, the state of Alaska with uh, environmental uh, agency, uh, uh, Health and Social Services, uh, and other agencies, Indian Health Service, uh, Public Health Service, and so forth, 
and then of course the, the local communities. Um, uh, so this partnership is uh, still in the formation stages. Uh, the group of Alaska Natives and federal and state agencies uh, testified this last May before Senator uh, Daniel Inouye's uh, Indian Affairs Committee and we've been working this year, all of this year, in um, uh, uh, coordinating uh, the different programs of the federal and state governments with those with the Alaska Native Health Board, Alaska Federation of Natives, and so forth. What are Kasiglik uh, plans uh, to, to, take, to take care of water and sewer, um, Yako? Well, let's start right now. Uh, we're looking into trying to uh, uh, getting water and sewer in both villages because there's two separate villages in my place. There's uh, one in the uh, Agula site. And where, where would you, where would you be looking to get the money from? Right now, I wouldn't know uh, which where to go in order to get funding for that uh, water and sewer system. So the village the doesn't really know where where it can get some help. Mm -mm. <clears throat> a lot of a lot of villages are in the same boat, um, and really don't know who they should approach. Uh, can can you shed some some light on that? Each um, year, uh, uh, John and Yako, the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, sends a questionnaire out to all the, the communities to identify what water, sanitation, mm -hmm. solid waste. Uh, projects uh, are, are needed and um, then these are uh, compiled and uh, 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 rated or evaluated by um, health risk criteria and so forth and then these become candidates for funding by the Alaska State Legislature and the Alaska State Legislature has funded um, uh, 24 and a half million dollars worth of projects uh, each of the last, the current year and each of the last two years. And the federal government also provides some um, funding and uh, we also have been working with uh, the congressional delegation, uh, Alaska St Senator Ted Stevens on the Appropriations Committee to get federal funding. Um, but each community is asked to identify what its needs are um, and then uh, these needs are evaluated. But this raises a, a really good point because Yako points out uh, uh, he doesn't really, his community doesn't know how to do this and because of our very difficult environmental conditions, wetlands, uh, permafrost, uh, arctic, subarctic conditions, uh, local communities do not have the capability of doing their own planning for this. And this is why this partnership is so important so it's not good enough that we send questionnaires out and say, you know, tell us what you need. We need to have a teams of engineers and specialists uh, work with the local communities in saying, hey, in this community we need uh, to have, um, you know, new power sources, energy systems, uh, uh, water, uh, look for water sources, uh, and then look for uh, uh, sanitation disposal sources. And I think, um, in all fairness, uh, it, you know, it isn't good enough to just send you a questionnaire and, and, and comment. What mm -hmm. we've got to do is have a, uh, a working relationship of going out there and, uh, and uh, identifying what you want within the community. So how, how much money has been spent so far? Uh, you, you mentioned $24 million. Is, is that going to be money that's spent over a period of uh, next five years, or well, what was that for just last year? Monies carry over uh, in, in, in construction projects, and it, make two, it may take two or three years. But our intent, our objective, is to have a minimum of $50 million annually, 25 state and 25 federal annually, uh, and how close are you to that? Well, we, we are very close. We, we've had 25 uh, state monies in each of the last three years. $25 million in state money. In state money. And um, this year, um, thanks to uh, this federal partnership of Environmental Protection Agency, uh, 
Department of Agriculture and the Congressional Delegation. We have 15 million from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have, uh, I think, three and a half million from the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, so uh, other sources. 21 million when, so far. I guess the federal. question will be, when can the villages out there expect something to start happening? Um, oh, it's happening. Uh, uh, it just has not happened in Yakel's village uh, yet. Um, we have um, actually over a hundred of the villages online to uh, uh, to have projects uh, built, um, uh, but they must meet certain criteria, uh, and in each community must decide what it, it wants. Uh, do do all people uh, use the the uh, bunkers and and the waste disposal site, or are there still some some of those who who dump their waste anywhere? Well, the in the old village. I mean, number one village in this where I'm staying, we're still using the bunkers. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in that other village, the Agula side, which is, ab is about maybe almost a mile from us, they start using that uh, new system and they're um, dumping their honey buckets away from the village, which is about maybe half a mile or something like that. And they're still having problems right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, during this freeze-up, and we just started that, and they're having problems already. So there are there are problems that are going to be uh, dealt with in the next 10 to 15 years, probably. We've been talking with uh, Commissioner John Sandor of the Department of en uh, Environmental Conservation and uh, Yako Slim from Kasigluk about the, uh, uh, the lack of water and sewer systems in, in the villages. And I uh, want to thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time coming down here and, and spending it with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One, do you know the difference between HIV and AIDS? The virus does not discriminate. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's edition of One Sky. I'm Jeannie Green. Join us again next week, won't you, where we'll be discussing more issues in rural Alaska. See you then. We still have... I think a long, long way to go before we can catch up with the rest of the United States as far as, you know, sanitary conditions are concerned, living conditions are concerned. Here they can put people on the moon, they can take care of other countries, but they can't take care of their own people around here. It's a shame, it's a doggone shame that, you know, this condition still exists in this 20th century United States.